Kuti and Cecilia and Kit. Uh, this is a really great illustration for us, so I'm going to keep that right there uh, for us to think about coming to the living water of the Spirit of God and being poured into, and then that pours out onto all people around us. That is like the perfect image. Thank you, Keith, for that image. Have you ever been blessed by someone? Right? Uh, yeah. Not, I'm, I'm not talking about like when someone pays for your coffee in the Starbucks line, you know? <laughs> that is absolutely good. That is most certainly blessing, right? That's good fruit right there. Uh, but I mean like the kind of depth of blessing. Right, of a person who gets up close and kind of is in your story and hears you and, and invites you into their story. Do you know what I'm talking about with that kind of blessing? Um, it doesn't surprise me uh, that this person came to mind as I was thinking about this because of uh, Pastor Britta's sermon last week. Uh, but our former colleague, uh, Michelle, uh, passed away from pancreatic cancer a number of years ago. Uh, and she was an incredible blessing in my life. And I don't think I even realized how much of a blessing she was in my life. And I don't think she even realized... Uh, the kind of blessing she was in my life. Uh, particularly uh, near the end of her life, uh, she invited me in to her story. She invited me in close. Uh, I vividly remember uh, a moment of holding her hand um, and her inviting me to listen to her story, for me to hear what she had to say, for her to uh, pray with me, for us to get close to each other. Uh, and I was, as I've been reflecting about why, like, certainly there were so many reasons, but like, what was it about Michelle? Why was it that I felt so blessed? And I think uh, what happened is Michelle invited me to get in close to her story. And she invited me uh, to hear how God was at work in her life and how she was uh, desiring for God to be at work in the life of her family. And so she invited me in close into this place of her story, and she, uh, she never, I don't think, set out to do this. But she affirmed my pastoral calling perhaps more than anyone else uh, in my life besides family. Because she got in close and she invited me into these holy and sacred places in her life. And I just received blessing after blessing after blessing from her because of the proximity of her story to my story, the way she invited me in. And I, I, again, I don't know if she even intentionally did these things, but as I was reflecting and thinking about this, uh, Michelle got so close to God. And she did the hard work of what Pastor Britta talked about last week of this baking good bread, that she was covered in flour. That Michelle was covered in the flour of her maker. And so as I got close to Michelle, the presence of God just got all over us. It couldn't help but just bless me time and time and time and time again. And I, I think this is the invitation I want us to think about in the context of when we're talking about blessing. We're talking about people that get in close and that we seek to get in close to people's story and that it would be this kind of being covered in the flower of our maker, right? That we need to be poured into by God, that we need to be attending to our relationship with God. And so our kind of primary goal is to get into kind of proximity to God and to be with God and for God to be forming these things in us. And so then in process, when we seek to bless others, we get up close in their story and the water just starts to spill all over. The presence of God just starts to spill all over. You can, uh, when we talk about these words of kind of blessing, I think sometimes we have this aversion like, well, I'm going to go and uh, only do a good thing, which is certainly a, a gift, right? Free coffee, we're not going to say no to that. But this idea of blessing is this idea of how am I attending to my relationship with God so that when I get close to someone else, they experience the goodness of God for themselves, right? This is what we're talking about. And, and we, uh, we are using uh, this word, uh, these words, bless, that's... Uh, a language that sometimes has been talked about is evangelism. Now, I admit uh, evangelism is a buzzword, and that there's some kind of like really deep feelings that come when we hear the word evangelism, right? Some people have been hurt by the idea of evangelism. Some of us may have been hurt by the idea of evangelism, of this kind of prepackaged way of how we have to handle things. But evangelism means a good news bearer. Someone who bears the good news of God. And so if we are going to bear the good news of God to the world, if we are going to bear the good news of God to people, it needs to be born within us first, right? That our hearts become soft like this sponge so that as we go out, we would bless the world. And not that we would go out and, and uh, that our blessing is somehow making us better than others, but rather that the goodness of God has so saturated our life that we are saturating the world with God's goodness. 
Uh, I really appreciated last week, Pastor Britta talked about uh, BLESS is this acronym for begin with prayer, listen with care, eat together, uh, serve in love, and share your story. And she talked about these five elements not being a formula, but rather that these are kind of uh, elements of a recipe for baking this good bread, this bread that we desire to share at the table together. And so this morning, as I've been thinking about our passage, we're kind of continuing this introduction to this idea of bless. We're looking at John chapter 17. And I want us to think about this passage somewhat as a bread pan, right? That this is uh, giving shape and structure to this kind of recipe. How can this kind of hold how we seek to be blessings, how we seek to be good news bearers in our own self, that that goodness of God would then spread out into the world? And so as we uh, come to the scripture this morning, I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 17. If you have your Bible with you, you can take that out. There's a Bible in the pew or chair in front of you. The words will also be on the screen. Uh, And as Keith has kind of introduced for us, this is a prayer that Jesus is praying right before his death and resurrection. And uh, there are kind of a couple headings if you have a a more modern Bible in an English translation, the New International Version is what I have. It says, Jesus prays for his disciples and then Jesus prays for all believers. And so the passage that we're going to be reading this morning is kind of picking up Jesus' prayer in the middle of his prayer for his disciples and then kind of just goes into the introduction of Jesus' prayer for all believers. Okay, so this is a prayer that Jesus is praying uh, kind of right before he... uh, is crucified and resurrected and brings about new life. So it's John chapter 17, beginning in verse 13. Jesus says this, he prays this. I am coming to you now, Father, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them, the disciples alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I will admit, um, as I was thinking about this passage uh, in the context of blessing or evangelism, it kind of changed my perspective a little bit because I've heard this prayer uh, kind of prayed by Jesus kind of in the context of kind of moving towards uh, his death and resurrection. And so as I thought about this in the context of blessing, it, it, uh, it reframed a bit. It was perhaps taking out a bread pan that maybe I hadn't used before. Or it was an invitation to kind of thinking of this bread pan of holding this bread. Does everybody know what the, the bread analogy is, by the way? Or is that kind of confusing? Just to describe, Pastor Britta last week when she was talking about blessing, she was talking about making bread and that these elements, the bless, are these elements of a recipe of kind of making bread. And as you make bread, it seeks to feed people and feed yourself. And that the the process of making that bread, which is the context of being in relationship with God, the flour kind of gets all over you, right? And so the sign of kind of your, your being in the presence of God is you're kind of covered in this flour and that flour just has a tendency to get all over people. As you give people hugs, they get the flour from them. You see kind of what we're talking about with making this bread. Okay, so this passage this morning then is a bread pan of how it holds these recipes. And so I was thinking about uh, this idea of uh, blessing in the context of the prayer that Jesus prays, and it turned my mind a bit. As we were talking about this at staff meeting, uh, Pastor Britta talked about the very beginning and the the framework uh, of thinking about this prayer that Jesus prays in the context of blessing people. And she talked about at the very beginning, it says that Jesus prayed that the joy would be fulfilled within them. And so it was this invitation, she said, of I think sometimes when I think about blessing or evangelism, I think uh, about going uh, out and you have to like kind of invite people to make a decision, which is a part of discipleship, right? Decisions are still a part of discipleship. But she said, if I think about this in the context of framing that, what if, what if instead I want the fulfillment of joy to be in the people in my life? 
right? I want this, this joy to be inside the people in my life, the, the, the relationships that I have, the people that matter most to me. I want them to experience this fulfillment of joy. Uh, fellow covenant pastor Peter Hung, as he talks about this passage, he talks about joy and this fulfillment of joy with the analogy of a cup of water and a well. And so he's saying, yeah, a cup of water is certainly, it satiates you for a while, but a well is this kind of deep life spring, right? It's, it's ever giving, it ever kind of fulfills you. And so the, the fulfillment of joy that Jesus prays for here is this wellspring of joy, this thing deeply within you that would feed your life. It's almost as if it defines kind of your life purpose, that you would continue to have this joy, and that joy comes from what Jesus continues to pray. And so it reframed for me this idea of blessing, that when we bless others, our desire is for other people to experience kind of this wellspring, this life-giving joy that comes from Jesus. At the same time, as we do those things, as we go out in, kind of bathed in the goodness of God, the own kind of wellspring of joy bubbles up within us. Is this kind of making sense? That, that as we go out, we're, we're not seeking necessarily to uh, kind of only have a person make a decision, but our desire is for this person and blessing these people that they would receive this kind of wellspring of joy within them, that they would experience the goodness of God for themselves. And that's kind of our desire in seeking to bless people is that they, we would get up close. We may not even necessarily intentionally intend that they would, uh, you know, make a decision or do something. But that as we get up close in their story, as we live life with them, the goodness of God gets all over them because we are working on the goodness of God in our own life. And so there are three other words that I, it kind of stood out to me in the context of thinking of this of blessing and blessing uh, people and what does it mean to receive the blessing of God. And the three words that kind of... Uh, shimmered for me as I was reading this, are the words sanctification, sending, and unity. Sanctification, sending, and unity. <clears throat> and the three words, as we talked about kind of back on Pentecost, we talked about the Spirit of God kind of being like cottonwood, right? It comes and it goes and it flows around and we don't really control it, but these kind of this cottonwood just flies through the air here and there. And these three words, there's a lot of movement to these ideas. And they kind of inter play off of each other. And they're kind of doing this movement of this flow that we can't control or contain, but we seek to kind of be within this movement of this interplay of these three, three ideas of the sanctification of sending and of unity. So the first word, sanctification, admittedly is a really big word. Uh, and it's uh, kind of inaccessible sometimes. And so a helpful way for, I think, us to think about the idea of sanctification is moving towards holiness. Now, I will admit, uh, saying moving towards holiness that feels unobtainable to me. Moving towards holiness is this like, whew, um, I am perfectionistically inclined. And so when I hear that, when I hear sanctification, I hear moving towards perfection. I hear uh, moving towards always making the right decision, always doing the good thing. And so uh, it can be really daunting and really inaccessible to think, okay, sanctification, the, the process of moving towards holiness, what is this about? And I think uh, what happens is as Jesus is praying this prayer, he prays that he is not of the world, nor are his disciples of the world. And so as we think about this idea of sanctification, I think we uh, oftentimes kind of fall into the trap of thinking of these kind of the duality of our, our individuality. Right, that there's this, the physical world, uh, and so the physical is this bad thing, and the spiritual is the good thing, the holy thing, and so these two things are kind of at, at odds with each other. And so what am I supposed to do if I'm supposed to move towards holiness, towards the spiritual thing, then I'm kind of being pulled apart. My physical self and my spiritual self are being pulled apart. Um, have any of you ever seen, um, like, kids' slime? You know what I'm talking about? If you don't know what kids' slime is, it's like silly putty, but way grosser. <laughs> uh, silly putty, does anybody know what silly putty is? Okay. You, it's gooey stuff that kids like to play with, right? And so slime is what it sounds like. It's like slime. And so I was thinking about this context of if we think about sanctification or holiness as being this idea of, of the physical and the spiritual and these things are in conflict, the duality of these two realities, if it's like this holding the slime in our hands and as we pull these things apart, what starts to happen? Right? The slime gets thinner and thinner and thinner and then whoop, everything falls apart and you're just covered in goo. Right? Right? That's what happens. As you pull this slime apart, it's like, and then just goos everywhere. 
And so if we think of sanctification of this process of moving towards holiness as the physical and the spiritual at tension with each other and pulling against each other, we ourselves then become stretched so thin that we just ooze all over the place. And I think that the invitation for us in thinking about the idea of sanctification of moving towards holiness is that uh, holiness has this idea that we, sometimes we say these words of being set apart, right? Of being set apart, of, of separating from something. Now, when uh, the gospel writer John writes about the world, he is not speaking specifically of just the physical world. When John writes about the world, what John is writing about is the way in which uh, the world is ordered in opposition to the creator. So the world is to be understood, not as just like the physical world, the world is to be understood as organized in such a way that it's in opposition to God. And so when, when John and when Jesus is then praying this prayer of sanctification, it's this idea of a movement, not of, of the physical and the spiritual pulling away from each other, but rather it's how am I being open-handed with the things that are ordered in opposition to God, and how am I attaching myself to the purposes and the presence of God? Do you see the difference? Because I think sometimes we think of sanctification as this pulling apart, and we just get stretched so thin that we just goo all over the place. But, but what Jesus is praying for his disciples, I believe, is this invitation for them to say, how can you release yourself from being disordered in relationship to God and to order your life in such a way that you are attaching yourself to the purposes and the presence of God? And so as you're moving, as you're seeking to be in relationship with God, this process of moving towards holiness is this process of seeking more and more and more to attach yourself to the purposes and the presence of God while opening up and releasing yourself from ordering yourself in a way that is opposition to God. It's this kind of release and attachment, attaching to the purposes and presence of God. And so as we do these things, I have to admit, even this last week as I started to shift my thinking of this not being perfection, uh, it was a helpful kind of evaluative tool for me. It seems really simple. But when I found myself facing conflict, or I found myself facing anxiety, or I found myself uh, concerned about things, I would start to ask the question, am I attaching myself to things that are disordered in relationship to God? Or how can I, in this instance, attach myself to the presence of God? How can I make a decision in this moment to continue to seek to attach myself to the presences and the purpose of God? So this is the first kind of invitation. This idea of sanctification, moving towards holiness, is really how am I attaching myself to the purposes and presence of God? And Jesus prays for his disciples that God would sanctify them. So essentially, Jesus is praying, Jesus, help my disciples to attach themselves more to your goodness. Help them to order their lives in such a way that they are attached to your purposes and your presence for the world. So this is the first idea, the sanctification of moving towards holiness. Then it says that Jesus sends them out into the world. So we have sanctification and then being sent. Now the word that's used there for sent is a word that you're probably familiar with. The word that's used there for sent is apostolo, which is where we get our word apostle, right? Apostolo in its most basic definition is to be sent. As Pastor Britta talked about last week, apostleship is this idea of bearing good news. Right? And if we're going to bear good news to the world, we have to bear the good news in ourself first, this process of attaching ourselves to the purposes of God. And so in this uh, idea of being sent, of being apostled out, uh, the word apostle is actually a combination of two other words, apo and stello. And the word apo means to be set apart. Interesting. Like sanctification, the process of attaching ourselves to the goodness of God is like this apo, to be set apart, and the word stello means to organize things rightly or to bring things together. So apostleship, being an apostle to be sent out, is to seek to be in the presence of God and to attach yourself to the purposes and ordering your life into the purposes of God so that you might go out and help others attach themselves to the purposes and presence of God. Is this kind of making sense? Yeah, okay, so sanctification, apostleship. And so as I was thinking of this idea of sending or apostle, I thought of magnetism, obviously, right? Everybody thinks of uh, magnets when you think of apostles. Now, um, I will admit I am not a scientist, okay? I know there are many very scientifically minded people in the room, and so you are going to have to correct me if I'm wrong, okay? But this got me thinking of the idea of magnetism, uh, like your high school science project, right? And so you have a magnet and a metal rod, and a paper clip, right? 
And if you take the metal rod and you tap it onto the paper clip, it doesn't do anything, right? It just makes clink, 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 I think so. But you take the metal rod and you rub the magnet across the side of the metal rod. Now, correct me here if I'm wrong, scientists in the room. Um, and what happens is the electrons align in order. Yes? The electron spins. Okay, well, so it spins a lot into order. Sure, okay. Thank you, Ron. Spins. See, uh, apparently I was not paying attention to high school science <laughs> because I thought they just aligned. So they spin. It spins a lot. Okay, so the magnet then has this effect of ordering the rod in such a way that as you then bring it to the paperclip, it sucks to the paperclip. And so I was thinking about this and the idea of Jesus sending people out, right? Of being a sent out in apostleship, this oppo set apart to bring things together. And I think sometimes we think of being sent out in blessing or being sent out to evangelize. It's like we have to go and like death grip people. Like, we want you to know Jesus, right? Come, come with me. And then we have to do this kind of this death grip work of like, you have to do this thing. And I think the invitation for us and the idea of apostleship of being sent out is this idea of magnetism. It's that as we ourselves are getting closer to the presence of God, our life is being ordered in such a way that things are becoming in alignment, right? That we are ordering our life in the, in the ways of, of God, that we're seeking to figure out the goodness of God in our own life. And as we do that, as we go out and get close to other people, they are magnetized not to us, but to the work that God is doing, to the goodness of God itself. Do you see the difference? that we ourselves are not the magnet, we aren't the ones that magnetize people, but we are in the process of being in right relationship with God, and as we do that and order our lives in such a way that we become in alignment with those things, other people wonder, what is God up to? The goodness of God is getting all over me, and I'm attracted to the goodness of God. Right, because I think sometimes we think that blessing or evangelism is up to us. I actually think the broadest invitation for us in this whole season as we look at the summer of blessing people is that the, the role of blessing and of evangelism is God's work, is God at work in people's life. And we just get to be the conduit who are seeking to get our life in, in alignment with the purposes and presence of God so that other people would experience the purposes and presence of God. It's up to God. We just get to be the people that get up close to people to cover them in the flower of this good bread, as we ourselves are covered in the flower of the good bread. And so the invitation for us is, if we're not paying attention to our good bread making in our own life, and bearing the goodness and the goodness of God in our own life, that we are incapable of going out and sharing that good news of God, because we need to order ourselves in alignment with the ways and purposes of God. Amen? Now, here is the real kicker, and what messed me up this week. Actually, it's been messing me up for a long time. Verse 21, uh, Jesus in verse 20, Jesus is now praying for all believers, which when you hear a passage like this, right, is all people who seek to follow Jesus now, because we're not the disciples. We're the people who've heard the word of the disciples through a lot of other people. And here's what Jesus prays in verse 21, that just, whew, Jesus is praying my prayers for not them alone, but I pray for those who believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, that they may be one. As a person that seeks to follow Jesus, this is a convicting word for me. Because I will be honest, when I disagree with someone, it is so much easier to be two. When I have a difference of ideology, it's so much easier to be two. When I have a, a stronger opinion about something that I disagree with a, another way that someone is acting, I, it's easier to be two. That if my understanding of, of how I interpret and how I engage in scripture and how I am holding theology, it's so much easier to be two when I don't speak the same language, when I don't have the same culture, the same lived experience, it is so much easier to be two, or to be 50, or to be 500 or 5,000. And the invitation, Jesus says, is that they may be one. One. And the crazy part is, 
that if we do the difficult work of seeking to keep our life in alignment and in ordering our, our life and priorities on the priorities and presence of God, and we are going out and sharing the good news and the goodness of God, as that pours out to other people, the witness to the world is that we remain one. That's like a really big deal. It is so much easier to be divided. It is so much easier to be polarized. It is so much easier to stick your foot in the ground and say, I'm only going to stay right here because I know it's the right thing. And that can be true. But how do we move towards unity together, towards this oneness? And see, the thing about this that I think is just such a, a brilliant um, invitation for us is that this is not uniformity. It's not that we all think and act and function and do all the same things and all think the same ways, right? Because Jesus says that they may be in us. And so those who seek to follow Jesus, we have this Trinitarian theology, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons, one God. What? Right? Like this is some crazy mystery that is beyond our human comprehension because our brains in some ways probably aren't big enough to comprehend three persons, one God. This is crazy. And that's compelling. This mysterious way of God of being three persons and one God is this compelling, I don't understand and yet I want to be in relationship and organize myself in such a way that I'm attached to the presences and purpose of God. Uh, have any of you seen... And um, those swallows that, oh, it's, maybe not swallows, these birds that all fly in these like crazy directions, but they're all together. But they do like this crazy pattern. Do you know what I'm talking about? If you haven't seen it on YouTube, I think you type in like birds flying in unison. I don't know. It's really cool. Okay, or how about um, any, any people seen the movie Finding Nemo? A few of you. This will be lost in some of you. That's okay. In Finding Nemo, uh, there are all these fish. Right, uh, uh, Dory and Marlon are these two main characters that are looking for Marlon's son. And they come across these fish, and all these fish are swimming together in a school. And they all swim together to kind of create this message to help communicate of where they should go, right? They kind of create an arrow, and it starts to blink. It's all these fish, but they make these pictures. Or they make this picture of Marlon, and he's talking, and he's all grumpy, right? Like, it's really funny. It's, you should go watch the movie. It's a good movie. Anyways, so all of these fish are working together to communicate this same message. But what's uh, the failure, I think, of this particular illustration is they're all the same fish. And so I think what's crazy is it would be like a blue whale and a giant squid and a stingray and a guppy and a minnow and a marlin, which is, I don't a lot, all the different animals in the ocean, right? They all come together and they're all swimming together to create this picture and to communicate this message. And we would be like, what on earth is going on? What on earth is happening over there? This is crazy. This doesn't make any logical sense. I don't understand what's happening, but I'm really compelled to what's going on with all of these things working together to communicate something, to be in a different kind of way. And this is, I think, the invitation for us of this idea of oneness in the church, of unity in the church, is that all of these different people from all of these different places, all of these different cultures and languages and ideas, they're all coming together and people are being like, what are you guys doing? That is crazy. How on earth are you in the same place as that person? This doesn't make sense, but for the spirit and presence of God. This doesn't make sense, but for the goodness of God, which is aligning our lives in such a way that we seek to attach to the purposes and presence of God. That we would then, each of us, go out in our own spheres of influence and that we would share the good news of God just by being bearing the goodness of God within ourselves that it gets all over the people around us and they start to ask this question, what is going on? And so then we all come back together and we all look different and we all have these different ideas and these life experiences and yet God has called us together in unity and this is what changes the world. This is what blessing looks like. All of these people that we would never even expect are just covered in the goodness of God. As you came in this morning, uh, you should have received one of these pieces of paper. It says, bless. If you did not receive one of these pieces of paper, can you raise your hand? I have a few. I'm coming. I'm going to try to talk and walk. I think I'm coming. I am. Okay, I'll need a pen, too. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much. Yeah, just keep your hands raised. Um, okay, so this piece of paper um, is what we're, as a staff... <laughs> We've come to call this our francs. Um, has anybody seen the movie Princess or uh, Father of the Bride? Franck, right? So Frank, but we're calling him francs. 
Uh, and so FRONCs are as another acronym. We're into acronyms this summer. Uh, and so the, the spheres of influence in your life are friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, coworkers, and classmates. And so these are areas of, of relationships in your life, right? These are, these are kinds of relationships that you have. Friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, coworkers, and classmates. And the invitation in this practice is to be in relationship with God and in conversation with God. Who do you want me to be intentional with? What, what friendship relationships do I have that you want me to be re, uh, intentional with? What relatives do you want me to be intentional with? What acquaintances, people that you maybe see on a semi-regular basis but aren't in like deeper relationship with? What neighbors, what coworkers and classmates, who are you asking me to be intentional with? Now, I need to be frank with you. <laughs> that was staff approved, by the way, so <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm okay in that. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, okay, so I need to be frank. Um, we had a really good conversation at staff meeting, and I really, really appreciate uh, Pastor Scott and his wisdom, because he was talking about a practice like this uh, in the context of sometimes how we interpret uh, kind of maybe a stereotypical understanding of evangelism, and he said, I can kind of bristle at a practice like this sometimes, because it can be really easy to dehumanize a person by putting them on a list, because all of a sudden they become a project. And all of a sudden they become a, a, a person that I have to now go uh, rescue. And so we had this really, really fruitful conversation. I was so appreciative, we were so appreciative for the way that Pastor Scott invited us to think kind of beyond the surface level of these things. And something else I really appreciated as he can, we continued the conversation is he said, we only have imperfect tools, right? This isn't a perfect tool. There is a, a real tendency for, uh, uh, even unintentionally, that we could kind of try to make this a project. And that's not our hope or our design. And our hope in kind of framing these uh, kind of two weeks of introducing BLESS is that it would be an invitation for us to think differently about this, to create a different kind of bread pan to hold the kinds of uh, ideas of blessing. And so Pastor Britta, as we were talking about this, she said, I think what's really helpful for me to think about is that in this is this is the question, who am I being asked to be intentional about? And so in a lot of ways, this list of, of, making, uh, of writing down our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, acquaintances, coworkers, the, the purpose of this list is for us, right? This is not to kind of make a, a project for someone that has to come and do something and respond in a way that we think is gonna be the way it's gonna be. But the purpose of this is for us to ask the question, God, who are you asking me to be intentional with? Who are you asking me to get up close to so that they would experience the goodness of God? that this wellspring of joy that bubbles up within me, I desire for them to experience the goodness of your life, the fullness of your life bubbling up within them, this wellspring. And so this is our invitation for uh, looking at these francs: is who is God inviting you to be intentional with? And so we're gonna take a few minutes in, uh, in just a moment uh, to, to write out some of these names. And again, the point of this is for you, for you to ask, how can I bless these people in my life? And as we go about this summer, how is God inviting me into their story so that I'm intentional to get up close for them to experience God's goodness? It, they may not make any other decision or change other than knowing that I want to care and love them. That's why we call this sharing the love of Jesus with our neighbors, with our community. We want people to experience the goodness of God. And so what we're gonna ask you to do is as we fill this out is to then perhaps uh, bring this back with you next week or have these people in mind as we're gonna kind of then continue into this, the kind of process of these different forms of the recipe as we bring these names back. Uh, but as we start, I wanna invite you uh, into a posture of being open to what God is doing. Who are people in your life that God is asking you to get up close to? Like Michelle got up close to me, I don't even think she realized what she was doing. But she affirmed things in me in, in ways I could never put into words. And so how is God asking us to get up close for people? And so as we do this, we're just gonna take a few minutes to write down a name or two of people in your life that God is inviting you to be intentional with. And I'll pray for us, and then when we're, we all close our time in prayer as we move to the table, okay? Any questions or clarifications on how this works? Let me pray for us. God, we admit that as we uh, come to a, an imperfect tool like this, there can be a tendency for us uh, to make this about a project. 
or about a specific outcome. But God, I, I, my hope and prayer is that as we are, are attending to these things, as we are seeking to hold this in maybe a different bread pan than we've held before, that you would bring to mind in our life, who are you asking us to bless? Who are you inviting us to get close to? God, and that we, we don't even know the outcome. We don't determine uh, the exact things we have to say. God, maybe we don't even uh, say things directly, but other than that we just want to be close and bless people, to show them love. And so, God, I pray now in these few moments that as uh, we write down these names, that, again, this wouldn't be uh, losing their personhood, but rather affirming their personhood, affirming the image that you have borne on them and that we would seek to attend to our own image barrenness so that we could bear good news in our own being. So, God, now bring to mind these friends, these relatives, these acquaintances, these neighbors, and these classmates and coworkers, God. May this be more than a list, but an invitation to intentionality. As we move now to the table, I invite you to still continue to take time uh, to talk with God about who it is that he's asking you to be intentionally blessing.